So good morning, everybody. I hope that um, you all had a nice uh, night and are all rested and ready for this. So, because now you need to keep awake, this is gonna be a, a, a lecture book type of, of story in introduction. That's what Lars asked me to do, to sort of set the scene. So it's not gonna be extremely exciting, spoiler, but uh, I'm gonna do my best to, to keep you awake still. So drug development always, it starts with a great idea. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the whole process as Lars just did, but in a little bit more detail and try to highlight where this group actually can contribute. Uh, and there are many places as uh, Lars has already said. That was you, not me. Yeah, yeah? okay. <laughs> just, just do it like this and you will be. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll see if this one works, yeah. So, <clears throat> Just first, the, the, the project idea is, is of course, you need, to, you need to start there. And what I mean here is the project idea, um, some kind of target mechanism, disease, patient need, market opportunity. These are the guiding words. Oh, um, okay, I, I'll try. Uh, no, it does not work. So, okay, please. Um, so what I mean with the, tar the idea is, and what I usually find works the best, if you try to focus on a mechanism or pathway that when modulated generates a positive effect to a medical problem. It sounds like a complicated sentence, but, but it's really, sometimes people just come up with a target and they don't really know where, where it fits. So they want to work on this target, but they haven't yet identified what is the medical need that this is going to help us with. Uh, or they come up with a medical need and they have no idea where to start with a target. So once you have solved this rather simple question, then you can start the project. Um, and then you... <laughs> okay, so then you have your target molecule. <clears throat> you need to start thinking about, should I activate or should I inhibit it? Um, what is the disease and patient need? What is it really that this drug is going to achieve? Is there a marketplace for this? And for us as scientists, this doesn't come always naturally um, because we think if, if something is good, there will always be a place for it. But in drug development, and in the type of economical situation that we live in the systems, there's not always a place, even though it can work. So there needs to be a market opportunity and, and this needs to go into the thinking. And from all of these questions, you can start drafting something that is sort of the guide map through a drug development project. A target product profile, TPP. And I would say always start this early. Once you have just these, you have your draft path. And then you can go from there and you can expand your knowledge and you can fill this with all the details that it eventually needs uh, and will have when you get to your final drug. And just to, to tease a little bit about sort of this with where this um, assembly can, can really make some difference. Of course, a lot of the targets that you will work on have crystal structures. And these can come in very, very handy, and we'll come back to that later. But in understanding the mode of action for your drug eventually and where to position. So this is just a, a structure of one drug target molecule that it, uh, is worked on here in Lund. So please. Then it comes to identifying a drug molecule. You need to have a pharmacological approach. I said before, um, activating or inhibiting, um, but you also need to understand, uh, does your target uh, become modulated best by a small molecule uh, or a biologic? This is quite early on a decision you will have to make. Uh, route of administration is actually 
actually also something that is good if you at least have an idea about early. Um, that may change because the molecules don't behave as you want. But it's good to have an early target picture, an image. Again, this can really be linked to the market opportunity. If you need to change the administration route, the market opportunity may be gone. So important to, to try to understand. Uh -huh, this is not the right presentation. So um, hmm? um, let's go anyway. Small molecules. No, it's yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. It's just not the right presentation, but it's fine. Small molecules. Um, so these are uh, chemically synthesized uh, low molecular weight um, inhibitors or agonists of your target. Uh, they are usually metabolized and they can then create toxic intermediates. This is something um, that you always have to keep in mind working with small molecules. However, they are nice in the way that they are uh, usually non-immunogenic, so the, the body doesn't really react uh, immunologically to them. They can interact with multiple cells and organs, intracellular, extracellular, and they often have an acceptable species sort of um, uh, non-selectivity. So it can be used between different species. The biologics, and here I count uh, antibodies, there's spaces here in the front, yeah. So biologics, antibodies, peptides, scaffold proteins, um, all of these, they, are in, they have in common that they are derived from living cells. So that also may, makes them much more um, heterogeneic in their nature. Um, they have a high molecular weight um, compared to the small molecules. Uh, and I've set the threshold here arbitrarily at five, kil uh, five uh, kilodaltons. That's a normal small peptide. They are generally degraded into um, just building blocks of the natural proteins. So non-toxic things, um, amino acids, um, glycosylation pieces. Um, one of the drawbacks, though, is that they may uh, initiate an immune response and they are recognized as foreign. Uh, so that this is something to keep in mind and, and try to work on. It's, a, it's possible to really achieve very high selectivity with, for example, an antibody, which is often more tricky with a small molecule. Uh, and this is why they, they are um, sometimes really preferred type of drug uh, when you really need this very, very tight specificity. Uh, a drawback though, is that that specificity also leads to that homologous molecules across different species are not recognized. So a human specific antibody cannot be tested in a mouse or a rat that we commonly use in the lab. And that is, of course, uh, creating a problem. So how do, how do you then find these uh, hits and leads? Uh, small molecules, uh, stru structure-based design, fragment-based screening, um, HTS, uh, published leads, uh, patent busting. Uh, I thought this illustration was quite nice to put put up here because this is really an illustration of where you have a nice crystal structure of your target and you can use that to co-crystallize your small molecule and get hints for how to improve it. There is, a, there is one caveat with this um, that we've seen several times in, in, in projects and that is that using this method, um, if there are if you then use a new class of small molecule, um, actually you can open new pockets and change, make introduce bigger changes in your target molecule. These are often very difficult to predict, however, and despite that, that there are now computational sort of uh, methods that can really predict quite a lot, these types of more bigger structural changes when you open up the structure in a different way are often very difficult to predict. 
And hence, still, there is a room for these things like HDS, for example, for finding completely novel structures interfering with a molecule in a completely no novel way. Yes, we can go to the next one. Um, for biologics, um, traditionally immunization of an animal to generate <coughs> an antibody and from there you can generate monoclonals. You can also do antibody library selections, which is a more molecular way to generate leads. And it's illustrated by this little cartoon. I'm not going to go into that, but this is a phage display uh, I, library or selection mechanism. And that can actually be used both for antibodies, but also for peptides or scaffold proteins. And scaffold proteins are then um, new and improved variants of uh, antibodies. And you can debate if it's improved or not, but they do have some properties that actually makes them better drugs. They are generally better, uh, have better stability. They can be almost, some of them can be almost boiled. Um, they are smaller. Uh, so they actually present uh, an intermediate between the natural immune system and, and, and uh, the uh, artificial drug. There are also natural molecules um, that, that you can sort of use. So cytokines, chemokines, and modify them in different ways and mimetics of these. So then we go to into the... The preclinical development part. We've now found our molecule and here we're gonna establish efficacy of the molecule. We're going to start our journey on how to formulate it. And here comes in again the question, which is your route of administration? Because that will really affect your formulation. Um, and safety. These are the top um, deliverables from this phase. Continue. Yes. Um, in some more detail, how do you turn your lead that is generated in the early phase, uh, the first molecule that binds and, and does what you think it should, uh, how do you make it really the drug? How, how do you optimize it? So for efficacy, you, you really need to find the right potency um, and efficacy. And why do I say both? Isn't isn't potency and efficacy the same thing? Um, not really. Um, I'm not going to draw uh, any of these uh, dose response curves to you, but uh, I usually do. Uh, potency is how low you can really go and it still has its effect. So usually expressed as a, some kind of um, IC50 inhibiting concentration that introduces a 50% inhibition then or activation if it's an EC50. Um, and, and, and you would get the nanomolar or picomolar concentration that is required to get this 50%. The, the efficacy, however, is for an inhibitory molecule, usually you only talk about good molecules they, they really inhibit 100%. There's, there's, there's nothing. So for, for those types of approaches, efficacy is never really in the picture. But there are, for agonists, on the other hand, many agonists, you may not want to have 100% activation. You may just want to modulate. And this is where you find your pharmacological sweet spot. And that's when you start talking about efficacy. The natural ligand may actually introduce 100%, but you may just want to modulate it. You may just want to have an 80% or 60% efficacy. And, and, and this is really where, again, it's important to be able to understand your molecule, how it binds. And some of this work can actually be um, very much aided by structure 
uh, rational structure design where, where you can see well, I need to move a certain, uh, a certain helix in my protein uh, a certain way. That's when I get my perfect pharmacological effect. In this phase, you also need to establish uh, a maximal and minimal effect doses. And this is for your um, further development to really understand where do I have my safe dose. And where can I start dosing without the risk of harming my patient? Um, and where should I put my tox doses? Here you also characterize the pharmacokinetic profile. So how fast is the drug taken up? How does it distribute? How is it spread through the body? Um, you ensure that it really reaches its target. Many drugs have failed because there is not enough drug in the target organ. And this has been a saga for many of the early antibody projects. Antibodies are big. Tumors um, have natural defenses towards taking up big molecules, macromolecules. And actually many of the first antibodies for oncology did never penetrate enough the tumors to have the intended effect. And here you demonstrate something that we, we talk about as proof of concept. I'll come back to that. So I'm not gonna say a lot about the, the, uh, the CMC. So the, the, the formulation and more chemical development path um, apart from this, but you really need to do appro appropriate formulation for the intended route. And, and, and here again, uh, some of the, the types of technologies that are really the speciality of this group and, and, and you can perform at places like the MAX4 uh, and later on hopefully at ESS is around sort of understanding crystallinity, understanding that you get the right size and the right shape of your particles uh, to generate um, formulation that can be taken up rapidly and, um, or not rapidly, if that's your intention, but the way that your pharmacological mechanism really intends it to be. Uh, here you also establish a manufacturing process um, uh, that ensures that you have a pure and stable API. Another important part here is the safety. I'm not gonna go into uh, details of safety testing, because it's, it's, a, it's an area of itself. But it is important that you can establish a maximal tolerated dose that you can understand how long time you can expose uh, an, an animal, which is in the safety studies, to predict that it's also safe for when you go into humans. Um, and therefore you make a series of different tests uh, usually conducted in two animal species, a rodent and a non-rodent, or for macromolecules like antibodies in non-human primates, since the crossover between species doesn't allow the pharmacology to actually happen in the rodent species. Just a, um, a few words on pharmacology. So, um, because I see that I've talked too much, as usual. Um, Overall aim is to predict and deliver a safe and effective dose. And this is, this is really the main aim of this whole package. Safe and effective. And I think sometimes we focus too much on one of them and others in the, in the team focus too much on, on, on the, the other. So, but you, they really need to go together. You need to establish an effective dose in order to understand that that dose is the one that is safe as well. Please, you can go. Um, and I also just want to, to say, you should think of structuring your studies in a way that you actually can build the individual pieces of information into a chain of evidence that your drug is really gonna work. Because at one end, you need to convince the physicians to take 
on and try this drug in the clinic. And then you need to have some rather good evidence behind yourself that this is going to work. Otherwise, it may not even be ethical to do the human test. So think of relevant cells, primary cells, disease tissues, correlations between in vitro and vivo, we touched upon this, and correlation between species. Use sensitivity when you need to, make sure that your data is reproducible um, and quantitative. These are, these are slides um, that, um, and pharmacokinetics, what the body does to the drug, and pharmacodynamics, which is in the next one. No, we, we take this. So I'm, I'm sorry, this is not the presentation, uh, the, the final, so it's, uh, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what's gonna come. That's why, um, PK, so the pharmacokinetics. I'm, this, is, this is just a, a very, very crude image. This is a very simple method. You label a peptide, that is your drug in this case, and um, you give it to an animal and you can actually follow it online, how it distributes. And of course, a lot of it will go to the, to the uh, metabolizing organs or excreting organs. But in this case, actually the, the, the key thing that we were interested in is, is, is rather up here. So at five minutes, uh, this is the salivary glands, and at five minutes, there's almost nothing. At four hours, you actually see quite a lot. 24 hour, this is when you see the maximum. And then uh, at 48 hours, it's almost gone. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is really a very nice, neat way that you can illustrate these types of processes and see them online. Please. Um, so pharmacodynamics then is the efficacy part. So. Uh, what the drug does to the body, how it affects it, how it affects the process that you wanted to affect. Um, and we can go to the next one. These are just a few, um, few words that, that everybody in drug development will, will talk about. That's why I wanted you to just hear them if you haven't heard them a hundred times before. And that depends of course on your background. But PKPD, what we just discussed, Pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics together, understanding when you have enough of the drug at the place so that it can actually have its effect. Um, proof of mechanism, this really relates to making sure that it works on the molecular target. Proof of concept, really that it works on the concept of the disease. Um, and make sure that when you establish a proof of concept or of proof of mechanism that is actually in a relevant animal model. Many models are nice to have, but maybe not so relevant for the final intention. So we go. Um, I, I I couldn't resist. So this is this is uh, this is an animal model of lung fibrosis, and here you can debate: is it is it relevant? Well, parts of it is, um, and this is this is work we've done together with Irma and Leo uh, within uh, a Tristan project where we, we have, um, where we have induced uh, lung fibrosis. And I just wanted to show it to illustrate how different types of imaging modalities can really be of use and be implemented. So since we're, we're here, you, you can see um, this, is, this is the tissue. The difference here um, is that you have a lot of fibrotic um, tissue up here. It's much thicker. You can also see this in, in the MR pictures. And, and this is, this is um, really a, a finding that I want Irma to talk about later on. So um, we, we'll leave it because I have only one minute left. Oh, please. 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 Leif will cover this. So that's, that's not a problem. Um, biomarkers, I just wanted to introduce biomarkers and imaging is a biomarker methodology that shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, and that really can be established in the preclinical and then taken into the clinic and that makes it unique. So please, 
um, clinical, I will just stay at this one because phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials is what awaits you if you want to get to a registered drug. Phase one is all about safety. It's all about safety, making sure that the drug is safe, that you can establish a dose that is safe. Phase two is all about efficacy, making sure that you can also find within that margin of safety, a dose that actually is efficacious and delivers the mechanism that you want to have, the pharmacological mechanism. And phase three is mostly about establishing that you have an efficacy that is comparable and actually better than competition and standard of care. And I, I think this is where we put it all back to this. There needs to be a market opportunity. And this is where, where you see this. And you don't wanna find this out down here that there wasn't. There wasn't even space because the patients are all very well treated. So with that, um, I leave you because I don't think that my last slides were, were the correct ones. So um, any questions? <laughs>